Okay, how we doing? We got a good number of folks here, so um, uh, I'm sure the others will catch up uh, very soon. So, um, welcome. Uh, I can turn on my camera, I suppose. Is it going to work? Yeah, there we go. Um, all right, yeah, welcome. Um, whew, busy week uh, for you guys, for me too. Uh, so, um, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, we're, we're really going to get into the meat of things in this course, uh, now and, uh, over the next few weeks, um, the, uh, I have gone through and reviewed, um, your project proposals, uh, you turn it in kind of late. I may have not downloaded yours yet or, or whatever, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, uh, catch up on that. Again, due dates in this course, other than at the end, are are soft, right? You make them work for you. Um, don't don't slam me with a whole bunch of stuff at the end of the semester, or you know, I'll be in a bad mood, and your your grade might reflect that. Um, not on purpose, but uh, it's just reality, right? And um, uh, but really, the the due dates there are to help you stay on track. Um, you know, you, you really don't want to fall behind in any course, and especially this course, because uh, we're covering a lot of a lot of material. So, um, uh, so this week I'm looking, you know, at your projects, uh, abstracts, and I have uh, submitted. Uh, feedback on all of those in Moodle. Um, I'm not exactly sure how the student end of Moodle works. Uh, I, I'm not sure if you get notified when I upload the uh, the feedback files, but basically I, I download all your files and I mark them up and then I, I upload them again. So you should be able to go to Moodle and, uh, and uh, see my uh, feedback from the uh, uh, that's written on your original uh, things, but it might be in a separate section of Moodle. Um, I do that with the homework also and uh, and also. I've also, um, you know, also this week, uh, looking at the research reports. Um, so, again, to review a, a major part of this course, is um, on the one hand doing a hands-on project that does something end to end um, and is you know kind of a complete tidy little project right and that gets you hands-on and it gets you real right uh, applied then um, uh, then there's the research reports where I'm asking you to uh, choose a particular topic within the general field of unmanned autonomous vehicles and then collect a number of uh, articles on that topic, research level articles, could be from a conference, could be from peer reviewed journals, that type of thing, right? and review those um and um um so we'll talk a little bit about how to do that um i think i've got it set for undergrads or at least those in the 449 uh eece 449 uh to do five total by the end of the semester and um uh, graduate students to do 10 total or or those that are in the ECEG 749 course to do 10 total. Um, I'll double check those numbers. Uh, looking to get soon some, you know, proposal from you or, or kind of a, an initial cut at things um, so that I can help you uh, uh, choose what topic you want to go for and how to actually write these uh reviews um come to think of it i'm not sure if i've uh uploaded a 
a document that talks about how to do that. I, I'm, I may have. Um, uh, there's a little presentation that uh, used in uh, prior years. I'll make sure that that gets up there. Um, yeah, so, uh, but basically the idea is that uh, you're going to, um, you know, uh, provide me a bibliographic citation and uh, then kind of a, a review of the paper. Uh, should be a critical review. And, um, uh, you know, grad students in particular need to be developing this skill to be able to read uh, research papers. And uh, part of that is going to be identifying particular research groups. Some research groups um, kind of have some um, notoriety or, or reputation uh, in a particular field, and that means something. It uh, doesn't mean everything, but uh, uh, kind of gives you a little bit of background. Um, in particular, what I look for is I uh, want you to be able to look at these things and uh, kind of assess, all right, what simplifying assumptions did they make in order to do their work? And um, what ways did they use, what means did they use to support their work, right? Did they do a simulation? Did they do a, uh, an experiment? Um, did they do a meta experiment where they analyzed uh, some pre-existing data that's out there kind of in a, in a new way? Uh, how did they support their, uh, their maybe theoretical derivations? Or is it simply kind of a show and tell, uh, here's what we did, yeah, yes, uh, top of thing. So, um, and then also do their uh, conclusions support their, uh, their or, or uh, I'm sorry, it, are their conclusions supported by uh, the rest of the paper, right? Or did they kind of all of a sudden just, um, you know, conclude something and you're looking at the uh, the experiment or the simulation, it's like, eh, I'm not sure that really supports it, right? So uh, developing that critical eye of understanding, um, you know, uh, how strong of a conclusion can you make about a you know, particular work. Um, it's also helpful to look at the citations in the work and that helps you kind of uh, then trace back uh, to other work uh, that it's maybe found uh, serves as its foundation, right? So you're, you're building up uh, work over the years, perhaps. Uh, sometimes that's from the same author or author group. Uh, the times it's uh, other other people's work, right? So uh, understanding kind of that flow of research um, and uh, what has preceded it. And uh, you can actually, using uh, IEEE Digital Library or uh, Google uh, Scholar, uh, be able to see what uh, and, and other other type of things too, Semantic Scholar and Springer uh, and other type of research sites um, allow you to see what other papers have cited it, right? So uh, there's what uh, papers, what prior papers, the uh, you know paper in question uh, cites in their uh, reference section, and also what uh, more recent papers have um, have cited, right, it, th this paper. And that kind of helps you to begin to understand how uh, important it is. Uh, in, in some ways, uh, professors chasing their uh, tenure, uh, trying to get from assistant to uh, associate or uh, associate to full or even postdoc to assistant, they're 
uh, uh, some of the, the silly ways that uh, you're evaluated is by counting how many citations that your papers have uh, as, as a, a very crude proxy of how relevant and important your work is. So uh, same type of thing happens in patents, uh, by the way. So um, the intent of this whole assignment is um, you know, twofold is one is to give you the skill, to teach you the skill that's, you know, again, particularly important for graduate students, but it's it's useful for everyone and being able to critically analyze uh, published research. Um, and the uh, second is to uh, provide you with a in-depth knowledge, understanding of a particular narrow subset of the field. Uh, of unmanned autonomous vehicles uh, so that, you know, if you've read uh, 10 of the most recent uh, research papers in a particular area, let's say uh, particle filtering using LIDAR um, uh, uh, for, you know, localization or something, then, yeah, you're you're going to have some level of expertise. Uh, it's not like you've been working in the field for 10 years, but uh, you should, at, you know, at the end, be able to talk very credibly uh, about that particular type of technology. Uh, some pitfalls that people have done in the past have, um, uh, you know, ignored my uh, emphasis on being narrowly focused, right? And uh, they end up, uh, let's say, for example, in autonomous vehicles, they might uh, review one paper on uh, uh, deep neural networks for uh, computer vision, and then uh, another paper on Coleman filters, and another paper on particle filters, and another paper on um, actor critic reinforcement learning or something like that. No, 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 right? Pick one topic, right? And uh, I know we're just getting started and you know you may not know what's gonna hit you in, uh, in a few weeks uh, in this course, uh, but you can look ahead. You can look at all those learning objectives. You can look through the book, uh, look at later chapters of the book um, or uh, or just look uh, at the topics that I've outlined in Moodle, or talk to me during office hours and get an, uh, an idea. Um, but generally, we're, we're covering localization issues now. Uh, we're uh, going to start talking about uh, sensor fusion uh, today and um, some uh, approaches to dealing with nonlinear uh, non-Gaussian type systems, then uh, we'll move into um, uh, perception and there'll be some sensor work there. You could choose to dive into a particular type of sensor uh, from a hardware perspective. Uh, sensors are what uh, work in the, you know, the physics level, right? So uh, you're, you're probing the physical world and turning that into uh, something we can use in a um, in a computer, right? So, um, um, so there's uh, definitely a lot of uh, research that is done at that level. Uh, so you may choose to look at um, uh, ways to uh, implement millimeter wave radars to get um, much tighter beam widths um, so you can get better spatial resolution out of them or um, better signal noise ratio or, or something like that right so um, so uh, that it, you know these are all options right so um, uh, then we'll um, move into uh, 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 more of uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and uh, we'll talk about convolution convolutional neural networks, which is kind of the, the big way of uh, uh, doing computer vision. Uh, you know, then um, uh, we'll move eventually into deep neural networks and uh, 
some of the issues associated with them. We'll look at uh, reinforcement learning, which is um, maybe not as uh, popular as supervised learning in autonomous vehicles, but may have some applicability and, uh, and stuff. So uh, all of those are fair game. Uh, but again, don't try to do one in uh, you know, deep neural networks. Um, you would want to uh, you know, pick some aspect of deep neural networks. And uh, you'll kind of tack into that, right? So uh, you may say, oh, I've, I've heard about these deep neural networks. Uh, I haven't had a course in machine learning yet. And uh, so, and we haven't gotten there yet, but um, you know, I've heard about it in the news. So I think, uh, think that's gonna be cool. So you can start kind of diving into that and um, uh, then uh, get to uh, uh, the, you know, the level of, uh, yeah, what's kind of the hot topics these days. And uh, so in uh, most of these search engines like uh, Google Scholar, uh, you can uh, choose to search back only five years, right? So. Um, you're not seeing neural networks from the 80s when I first started working on them. Uh, you're looking at something that's uh, much more uh, relevant uh, and, and topical. So, um, and then you, you'll start to see some different types of uh, um, you know, top, topics that are discussed within that area and kind of zero in on them, right? So, um, and then uh, that that's part of what I'll be looking at uh, as I review your um, kind of proposals is, uh, yeah, have you uh, chosen something that's relevant and something that's narrowly focused? Are you, are you on the right track, right? So, um, all right, any, any questions on that? I know I think uh, it's due tomorrow again. Uh, you know, do what works for you. Uh, if you need some more time on this, uh, I know we we kind of talked about the project more than these research reports. So, um, but yeah, the sooner you get those in, the sooner I can give you feedback. Sooner you can kind of move on and and get get going. Uh, you know, just like in projects, uh, you can. Uh, uh, get yourself in trouble by underestimating the amount of time it takes to set up a development environment, to get parts, to assemble parts, to get it debugged, uh, that type of thing, right? Or, or uh, underestimate the amount of time it'll take you to learn how to use uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch or something, right? So um, in the same way, uh, you can underestimate the amount of time and effort it'll take you to really understand these research reports. Uh, when you, you know, I, I remember I, I read my first few uh, in my senior year of undergrad uh, for a microwave course and uh, kind of cringe and shudder when I think about uh, how naively I approached uh, uh, those, uh, those topics and and stuff it was on equivalent circuit modeling of microwave transistors and um and i kind of missed the whole point of uh of what some of those authors were were writing about uh because it takes a little time to kind of internalize and that type of thing so again trying to get you started early and and keeping pace um and i think you'll get the most out of it this way uh and again these should be uh, cool things that um, you'll have to talk about with uh, future employers um, during the interviews and that type of thing. So um, definitely choose something that's relevant to the course, but also relevant to what you want to do uh, with it. So, uh, all right, a few points of feedback on the project uh, uh, abstracts. Uh, it's a great start. Um, you know, I uh, did not grade those. I'm only providing uh, feedback on them at this point, not really uh, assigning a grade till the end, but uh, we'll make sure that 
yeah, if you want to put in the effort to get an A, you're going to get an A. Um, you know, I'll I'll um, I'll give you enough feedback along the way to to make sure that you know as long as you're going to put in the effort uh, that you can get there. Um, but um, uh, a couple of things, uh, just noting that you know at this level uh, you're either already in your career or very soon will be. Uh, writing is an essential part of being an engineer. You do need to communicate your work. Um, and uh, so I'll give you some feedback on that. Sometimes I'll correct spelling and grammatical errors. I'll, you know, uh, you know, uh, break up a sentence that I feel like a run on too long of sentence and I'll break it up into two sentences or whatever. But uh, really what I want you to learn how to do is write very clearly. And that starts with a descriptive title. Um, that's not, you know, assignment three. That is, uh, you know, something that describes what you're, you're doing there, right? So uh, do that, uh, make sure your name's on it. Uh, you know, I know who these all come from because I'm downloading from Moodle, but uh, um, but you know, on your document should be your name. Uh, so, kind of the essentials of any sort of uh, report or proposal or anything like that is is descriptive title, your name, and you know, in real life, there'd be your uh, affiliation, who you work for, or whatever. But um, not worried about that here, and a date. Um, it annoys me when I read stuff anywhere, uh, like a news article or something, and I have no idea whether that was written four years ago or yesterday, right? So it uh, makes a big deal in our, uh, in our uh, field. So, um, and then a uh, well-written uh, introduction uh, for reports like this. You don't need to, you know, especially if it's, you know, a, a few paragraphs type of thing. You don't need to spend a whole lot of time, um, you know, with with background information. Get to the point uh, and kind of lay out your thesis and where you're going with it. Um, follow that up in your conclusion. Uh, and then your paragraphs in between should tackle each one of those points, right? If you have 15 points, yeah, it's not good, right? So if you have one point, eh, maybe, uh, but you know, two, three points uh, that you're trying to uh, use to support some, you know, thesis or stance or uh, proposal or something like that, and then uh, address each of those in your subsequent paragraphs. Um, in this um, uh, homework, Two assignment, I guess it was uh, that I just graded. Um, that one uh, is, um, yeah, I was I was looking for like goals and objectives of some particular type of autonomous vehicle, and then your constraints, right? What are you kind of bound by, and then what particular challenges are you going to have? Um, I do that because that's a great way of approaching engineering problem. And again, in the real world. So, uh, and real world can be academic research too, right? But, um, but it's, uh, you know, frames your work well um, by uh, knowing what you're trying to accomplish, identifying that, right? And boom, boom, boom. And then, um, you know, understanding what are your kind of guardrails, uh, what are your limits, min, max, uh, uh, type of thing. And then the challenges, sit back and look at a problem. And, uh, you know, you probably ought to be doing this with your project, right? And uh, saying, what are the big challenges? And then uh, you try to anticipate those. Sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes uh, something you thought was going to be a challenge ends up being easy and something that was uh, uh, you didn't even think about ends up being the thing that that kills you right so um, but uh, identify those and then that will help uh, uh, guide you on uh, you know if you're running a team uh, you'll 
allocate your resources accordingly, your, your people, your money, um, uh, lab space, whatever, right? And schedule it accordingly, right? So uh, it's not always fun to tackle the hard stuff first, but we, we definitely want to tackle the risky things, right? Things that are uh, either have a, a high likelihood of failing or a real uncertainty about whether it's going to work or not, uh, or a big consequence, right, of, of failure. Right. So um, uh, hopefully you're learning about this in your first semester capstone course. If you're a, a senior, these are kind of essential uh, things that uh, engineers need to tackle in projects. So, um, you know, uh, just encourage you to um, be precise uh, in identifying those things and enumerating those in, in your work. So um uh, and again that that applies to your project so uh projects want to now make sure that if you're using hardware um uh, you don't have to do hardware right it can be a completely software type of uh, project and um uh or you can start with software and then if you are making good progress uh, then reduce that to practice, right? Um, a lot of y'all are choosing to use Arduinos, and you know that's that's fine. It's a very low-powered uh, 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 processor board. Um, you know, it it's, doesn't have uh, uh, full-blown operating support like a uh, Raspberry Pi or Jetson does or, or something like that. So, um, but um, yeah, if, if that's what you want to do, uh, you know, that that's fine. But, uh, uh, you know, just sometimes things can actually be harder because of that. But again, don't feel compelled to reduce it to practice if, if you know, in that, aspect that reduce it to hardware um but you're welcome to right so um yeah i've talked to a few of y'all in office hours and help guide you and that type of thing um uh feel free to to um talk to me in office hours about your project um this is a big part of the learning experience in this course is uh, is your projects. And please look at the feedback that I'm providing. Um, I've given some of you all some pointers towards data sets or um, uh, open source projects and that type of thing. So um, speaking of which, yeah, if you uh, choose to do a, a software only project and you, uh, you know, find an open source project and you download it and run it and boom it's it's done right well um let's let's figure out how to uh, make sure that's real for you right that you haven't just downloaded something and run it you don't know even how it works and you know let's let's make sure you've got a good learning experience out of that so um you know, that might mean integrating a few different open source projects together or, or something like that. So, uh, all right, uh, enough of all that. I killed a half hour doing that. So let me uh, start with uh, picking up where we left off on the last uh, lecture with localization. And I am kind of adapting this, you know, course as we go through um, based upon where, uh, you know, uh, where you all are at uh, in terms of background knowledge and that type of thing and, and just how we're going. So um, we're maybe a half lecture or more behind, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not worried about that. All right. So, um, uh, so we we kind of finished up talking about some signals, right? So we uh, uh, think we covered um, some characteristics of these, understanding that uh, the grad students have 
probably had some sort of communication course. Certainly, if you graduated from Manhattan College in electrical engineering, you had a, a communication course um, and stuff. So this uh, probably looks very familiar to you, BPSK, uh, QAM, these type of terms. Uh, if you're a senior or computer engineer, you may not have uh, uh, seen these things. So uh, again, it's uh, without loading this course up with a whole bunch of prerequisites, um, uh, kind of adapting the course so that you can pull out of it what uh, is meaningful for you. But basically, these are spread spectrum signals, and they operate on uh, uh, a few different common frequencies. Uh, there's there's two main ones here I've listed. Uh, there's actually some others. And for other GNSS systems, they operate at, at uh, other type of frequencies, but they're roughly in that L band, uh, you know, one and a half uh, gigahertz region. Uh, as it turns out in GPS case, they're all a multiple of 10.23 megahertz which uh, is nice because we can generate from one clock and we can generate all these different signals, including these uh, chips that then end up modulating uh, or, or spreading the, uh, the waveform uh, so that it actually takes up more bandwidth than is necessary to move uh, the data, um, but allows us to uniquely correlate uh the signals from each satellite so each satellite is transmitting uh all the time and all the satellites all the gps satellites are all transmitting at the same frequency all at the same time right so how do we how do we separate those out uh well we do that because each uh satellite has a unique code a spreading code and um if we correlate um uh, we, we have a receive signal and we correlate it with a code that matches a particular satellite, we'll get its data. If we change the code so it matches a different satellite, then we'll get that satellite's data. Uh, both time, uh, the timing things that we use to calculate our pseudo ranges, and also um, uh, the data that we'll see is encoded on these waveforms also. So these are the legacy uh, commercial signals. We talked a little bit about the military. It's basically uh, <clears throat> in, encrypted um, and, uh, and also, uh, but it's all classified. There's more modern uh, signals here. Not all of these are in full operation. Uh, basically, as new satellites get launched, they get um, they have the capabilities to handling these new codes, but until enough of the constellation has these newer satellites in it, um, those codes are kind of more in uh, beta testing phase and and that type of thing. So, um, all right. So here's really where we left off: uh, signals, data. So uh, we talked about how. Uh, each satellite sends its orbital information in what's called an ephemeris, or ephemer uh, plural, I guess, is ephemerides. Um, but it also includes some other data. This is uh, modulated at a pretty slow rate, 50 bits per second. Um, and so all this data is organized in uh, frames and, and words, and there's... Um, uh, specific uh, slots or, or words or frames in these uh, transmissions that uh, include all this data, right? So you just, once you get synchronized, you can uh, decode from a certain part of the waveform the satellite clock uh, uh, as a week number and the time of the week. And um, uh, then your, uh, and that's just the, the way it's coded. Um, and then the uh, ephemeris, uh, each satellite sends its own orbital data that is updated, right? And uh, then uh, each satellite also sends out the almanac, which is a much 
coarser uh, set of data of the orbits, but includes the whole constellation. So each satellite sends out uh, the almanac, which includes an overview of the entire constellation. Whereas its ephemeris is much more precise and accurate, but it's only for its own satellite, right? And um, so the other things in the almanac are some uh, basically uh, parameters associated with the ionospheric model. Uh, the ionosphere uh, is a big part of uh, the various effects that uh, change the velocity of the waveform. Uh, the signal is it travels from the satellite down to the receiver. And so uh, we model that um, uh, ionosphere and uh, then uh, measure it and model it and then upload that data to the satellites, uh, you know, the uh, Space Force handles that, I think, or maybe it's still the Air Force. Um, and then uh, each satellite uh, transmits that information so that the receiver can uh, uh, pick up those parameters of the model and do the corrections. The, Ionosphere is affected by the sun, uh, sunspot activities. This varies over, um, you know, a, a period of a, a day as um, that part of the atmosphere faces the sun versus uh, rotates away from the sun, uh, but also on 11-year cycles of sunspot activity um, that occurs on the sun and, and that type of thing, right? So, um, that data uh, uh, takes a long time to download, like 12 and a half minutes, uh, but it's valid for a fairly long time. Uh, whereas this ephemeris, it's uh, downloaded much quicker uh, and is uh, valid uh, for a much shorter period of time though, because uh, it's trying to be much more precise. All right, sources of errors. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I already kind of jumped the gun on the ionosphere, but uh, let's talk about the satellite clock error first. Uh, these have, uh, each satellite has a handful of atomic clocks, generally about four. Uh, some of the older ones are cesium, the newer ones are rubidium, uh, kind of the ones in the middle kind of have a little bit of, of each. Uh, so they all have multiple atomic clocks on them. Um, they're not quite as good and fancy as the ones in Boulder, Colorado at the National Institute of Standards and Technology or the ones in uh, England or Paris or, or elsewhere where uh, uh, international or national uh, standards organizations maintain um, an official time, right? And, um, but they're still pretty good, right? And they get synchronized uh, periodically. Uh, to that uh, kind of international recognition of what time it is right now. And, uh, but then each clock is compared on orbit uh, so that uh, you're not relying on just one, but you have multiple ones, right? So uh, they have limited accuracy. They're really, really good, but it's still limit, limited, right? And, uh, but this is measured and a correction value is provided. Uh, so, uh, ultimately, that ends up being a very small error once it's uh, been corrected. Um, we also have ionospheric delay. We need uh, to convert time to distance, right? So, in our uh, pseudo range, we're measuring this time with some clock errors and that type of thing. But uh, ultimately, what we're interested in is distance. But uh, the speed of light is what we would use to convert that uh, time to distance, right? So that's in seconds and that's in meters. Speed of light is meters per second. That's an easy conversion, right? But speed of light is is not constant in the ionosphere, right? So you probably learned in electromagnetic uh, fields or um, whatever that course is called, 311, I think, that, um, um, you know, EM waves travel at speed of light in free space, but if it's not free space, it's going to travel a little bit slower, right? So uh, depending upon uh, um, the uh, 
parameters of the media, right? So there's uh, these charged particles in the ionosphere due to the energy coming from the sun and other uh, space uh, stars and that type of thing, quasars, whatever, but mostly the sun. And um, so uh, there are multiple ways of correcting for this as we can use that model that's downloaded in the Almanac, uh, or you can measure two different, uh, the, the signal at two different frequencies, right? Uh, from if the uh, satellites, you know, transmits at two different frequencies, if you can pick those up, uh, then you can kind of counteract for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the receiver clock error is a big one, right? So these uh, uh, receivers, the ones in your, your phone, they don't have atomic clocks. Uh, yes, DARPA is working, uh, has worked on some miniature uh, atomic clocks and trying to make that affordable, but we're still a long ways from that, right? So um, these generally uh, have some sort of quartz crystal, um, and uh, quartz is used because it uh, is, uh, has, well, what uh, we call very high Q um, uh, or very narrow band filtering response is a way of thinking about it. And it's pretty uh, temperature stable and uh, doesn't drift a lot with uh, age or, or lifetime, whatever. So, um, but there's still uh, a lot of error associated with that, right? So, um, but yeah, we uh, we get the timing from the satellites, and if we have enough satellites, then we can uh, correct that time, um, as I think we talked a little bit about in the last lecture. Um, and uh, also, uh, satellites, they're kind of traveling um, in... Um, uh, a free fall type thing. If you've ever studied orbital dynamics in a physics course or something like that, uh, basically we we put a lot of energy into a rocket and uh, we we launch these things into orbit and we release them. We uh, for these type of things, we'd need a booster stage to get it up to medium Earth orbit, and um, uh, then there's some onboard thrusters that get it going in orbit, but there's no air friction up there. There's no other forces. So uh, Newton says that, yeah, once you put that body in motion, it should stay in motion. Um, and uh, so that's what happens. But, um, you know, uh, you, you can uh, look at this uh, as a two-body problem. You've got the mass of the Earth that provides a gravitational pull and you've got the mass of the satellite, which provides a gravitational pull. Uh, but uh, yeah, we've got a moon out there, we've got the sun out there, we've got other uh, things in our uh, solar system that tug on this uh, these satellites a little bit. So um, their orbits uh, are not as ideal as they would be if it was just the Earth and that satellite, right? So uh, they drift around a little bit. The orbit might get corrected, but that's part of what that ephemeris is doing. We're not going to go into the details of that, um, uh, but if your project revolves around GPS, maybe you do. Uh, but it um, uh, the data encoded in the ephemeris uh, is allows the receiver to be able to uh, figure out exactly where that satellite is and where it was and where it will be, right? So it can uh, uh, has enough data parameters uh, for equations to be able to uh, uh, propagate where that uh, satellite is at any given time. Uh, some more errors in the, uh, the troposphere, the tropopause, the stratosphere, basically different layers of our atmosphere. Uh, there's some delays. Uh, these are not that significant for uh, GPS satellites and medium Earth orbit, but uh, can be significant for other type of satellites. Uh, um, but um, if a, you know, when a satellite is just coming up over the horizon or just sitting over the horizon, it's going to uh, 
uh, move through that troposphere uh, for a longer distance. And um, uh, so any effects, retraction or that type of thing that might bend the uh, signal or uh, cause a delay, then uh, is going to show up with that. So uh, that's normally pretty small. But it uh, can be very local and very difficult to predict. So um, then kind of the one that does give us particular problems is multipath interference. So uh, just like if you uh, are in the mountains and you shout, uh, then you might hear an echo as, as your uh, shout bounces off a mountain and comes back to you or a building or something like that, right? So uh, signals also bounce around. So even as that uh, signal, as it propagates down from the satellite, most of the way it's uh, not going to have anything to bounce into, right? It's empty space. But when it gets right down towards the, uh, the surface, it can bounce around uh, to an annoying degree, right? So um, this uh, can occur in rural situations where, yeah, you, you might have uh, something bouncing off a mountain and still getting to your antenna. Um, it can also uh, uh, show itself in urban environments, uh, Midtown, downtown New York, Manhattan, uh, you're going to have this urban canyon uh, situation where that wave, you might get a direct path that goes direct to you, but you might get one that bounces off a bunch of buildings and then gets to you, right? And um, since we know from geometry that the uh, shortest distance between two points is a straight line, if uh, you no longer have a straight line because it's bouncing off of things, then it's going to be longer, right? So that's going to uh, uh, cause you some errors. And these, uh, these can be difficult to deal with. Um, one way of dealing with it is to use a directional antenna that is only looking up um, and has a very low response towards uh, the sides and you're more likely to catch that uh, main uh, direct path, but uh, still a problem. Uh, then there's uh, dilution of precision. You'll see this abbreviated as DOP. And um, that's kind of related to, a let's say, a momentary, unlucky, poor distribution of satellites. So think, think for a moment what that you know, what an ideal distribution might be and what a poor distribution might be. I think we talked a little bit about that in the um, uh, previous lecture when we first started uh, looking at localization by uh, multilateral lateration. Um, that basically if you have things kind of distributed on a line, a straight line, um, well, uh, you know, you, you might not get a very accurate fix because um, uh, those lines can be almost parallel, right? And where are they going to cross? Uh, you only need a very slight error in a measurement to move that crossing point quite a bit. Um, whereas if you're kind of distributed at orthogonal angles, then most likely you're going to get uh, a much better uh, crossing or, or the uh, point that uh, the lines cross uh, is less sensitive to any measurement errors. So um, a good uh, GPS receiver can calculate this. It knows uh, where the satellites are from its ephemeris, ephemerides uh, information. And so can uh, can recognize when uh, the satellites are poorly aligned. Um, uh, and but eventually that kind of gets corrected as the satellites uh, continue to move along their orbits and you get a better uh, 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 distribution of the satellite positions. Uh, so, you know, what, what does this mean, right? So a single frequency smartphone GPS 
accuracy, you know, uh, you, you can get a lot of different values for this, but uh, uh, might be on the order of plus or minus five meters. It's not very good, right? Um, it's uh, maybe a whole lot better by a long shot from other type of uh, navigation techniques, uh, celestial navigation, for example, or uh, the old Loran, if, uh, if you're a navigation uh, uh, hobbyist, you may have heard of that before. Um, dual frequency high-end systems can get us down to a few centimeters. So uh, let's look at some of this. Uh, so pulling this from your book, uh, we see that uh, there's some uh, numbers here. Some of these can be corrected. Uh, and some of these uh, are, are more difficult to correct, right? So uh, exactly what kind of error you're going to get up, uh, going to have for each of these uh, can be affected by how much work you've done to, let's say, uh, calculate the specific ionosphere delay and compensate for it. Okay. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Accuracy enhancement techniques, uh, kind of starting at the signal processing level. I know we've kind of hand waved over exactly how we get the time from these uh, pseudo, uh, from, from these waveforms to start our pseudo range uh, processing, right? But I've mentioned that there is a correlation uh, of these uh, long codes with each other. And that's kind of the uh, initial design of the system was uh, for at least commercial non-military users was to just uh, look at where that correlation peak shows up. And that's going to be limited, uh, the resolution of that, the precision of that is limited by your chipping rate. Uh, or how many uh, chips uh, you're using to spread that uh, waveform uh, and how long that code is, right? So um, the, the faster chips and the longer code you have, the narrower that correlation peak is going to be, and you'll have better resolution. Well, you can actually, um, with some uh, enough processing, track the phase of the code uh, and not just have that resolution to be the width of a single chip, but actually be able to kind of divide that chip up a little bit by tracking the phase. So that's kind of the first uh, approach at it. Uh, kind of the, the next thing, uh, well, it's a, it's a big jump because now you're tracking the phase of the carrier, uh, but now that uh, carrier is still spread at that point, right? So um, you are uh, needing to do some sophisticated signal processing to actually look at the phase of the uh, microwave carrier, the one at uh, 1.5 gigahertz. Um, and uh, But that's going to give you much, much more precision than just looking at the code, which is only moving at uh, uh, megahertz or so of, uh, of variation, uh, depending on which signal you're working with. Um, but you do need to now be aware of uh, the uh, how many uh, integer number of wavelengths you are away from the satellite, right? So um, at one and a half gigahertz, you can divide that by the speed of, uh, divide that into the speed of light and get your wavelength, but it's, you know, um, um, you know, a, a, a moderate uh, size type thing, uh, you know, uh, several centimeters, but um, you're really far from these satellites, right? So it's going through many, many, many wavelengths. And uh, you need to know, right? Am I at uh, you know, just arbitrary number, the, the one thousandth wavelength plus a little bit, or the one thousandth and one wavelengths plus a little bit, right? So um, uh, 
uh, there are ways of figuring that ambiguity out and making sure you don't slip uh, a cycle. But uh, that does take some time to converge, right? So you need to monitor it for a while. Um, I touched on this earlier. Uh, you know, we do have two frequencies that are available to us, L1 and L2. There's some newer frequencies coming online also. Um, if your receiver supports both of those frequencies, now, uh, as it turns out, the ionosphere is what we call dispersive. In other words, the speed of the wave traveling in that ionosphere is a function of frequency, right? Now, think about that for a minute. Speed of light is a constant, right? In free space, uh, an electromagnetic wave travels at the speed of light. Three, you know, almost 300 million meters per second, right? And um, uh, it doesn't matter whether that's at one megahertz or 100 gigahertz, right? Or anywhere in between, that's always the same speed. That speed is a constant. That's what we call non dispersive. But the ionosphere is uh, dispersive, lots of materials are. And that means that the speed at which the wave travels in that media is a function of the media, yes, but also a function of the frequency of the wave traveling through it. Uh, so we can take advantage of that and we'll know that if we measure it at L1 and L2, we can make a, a linear approximation uh, to that and interpolate uh, or, or uh, you know, solve a, a linearized equation and come up with a correction for the phase velocity in that ionosphere. Still just an approximation, um, but, uh, but it takes us a long ways to uh, compensating for that effect of the ionosphere. So all these are things that we're dealing with at the signal level. Um, there's some other ways we can improve our accuracy and that's what I'm calling collaboration. Uh, been lots of different uh, approaches at these. I'm picking three to talk about. Um, there's the wide area augmentation system. And this is what has been used in uh, uh, aircraft. Uh, with the FAA, and that has um, basically is composed of widely distributed stations at very well-known locations, and they're able to correct for ionospheric delays, uh, errors, uh, errors in satellite locations, et cetera, um, uh, because we know exactly where those things are, right? We survey them, uh, whatever, we know exactly where they're at, and uh, we receive that signal, we compare it to what it's supposed to be, fit that to a model, and now we can um, transmit that information on another channel such that uh, properly equipped receivers can pick up that compensation uh, correction information and apply it to them. Right, so you're going to pick the data that's closest to you, and uh, and correct for that. So now we can get down to a meter laterally or one and a half meters vertically uh, on that order. So that's generally good enough to land a plane with. Um, then there's RTK, real-time kinetic positioning. This is kind of similar. Uh, we're going to use a base station at a well-known location. And then um, we have some number of rovers, right? Other uh, stations that we want to cue or, or correct with the data from this base station. Now it's measuring the carrier phase. So it's doing basically all it can do in the signal space, um, but it's at a, a well-known location and then it, uh, basically communicates that carrier phase over a separate link. But now instead of like, you know, transmitting that a long distance, this is really designed to go 
um, like in a surveying application where you might send that uh, signal over a VHF link, uh, you know, a, a, a kilometer or something like that. Um, so, uh, but in doing so, you can really get amazing accuracy, uh, right? Like down to the level, of, you got to know how big your antenna is because uh, your antenna is bigger than this uh, type of thing, right? So you got to know exactly where the, the center of that antenna uh, is. Um, and then there's uh, PPP or precise point positioning. And um, this is, uh, again, using a lot of uh, reference stations. And uh, what they do is they uh, calculate out uh, or, or they obtain uh, information about what the true and accurate, precise and accurate satellite orbits and the clock information are, and uh, send that data out via the side channel. Now, normally this information is sent out through the ephemeris or the ephemerides for all the different satellites. Um, but there's only a certain amount of uh, uh, resolution you can get out of that, um, the, the way the data is encoded on the signals and um you know how often it's updated and that type of thing right so we can actually uh send out more precise and accurate information via a, a side channel some other communication means it might be a uh uh internet network type of thing right so um and again they're using uh this carrier phase tracking dual frequencies and you can uh, easily get to centimeter level accuracies and over a much wider range than this RTK uh, supports. Okay, so, um, all right, so finally some of the issues we have. Uh, the signals are, are very weak, uh, kind of by design, uh, partly because, yeah, satellites have limited energy available to them. Um, and uh, size associated with them. But uh, the signals are, are very weak with the low signal to noise ratio. Again, you'll study this a little bit more in, uh, in communication uh, systems next semester if you're a senior. Um, but uh, basically you end up with a lot of noise that's masking your signal and it makes it difficult to reliably correlate enough satellites. Uh, if you're in a building, uh, good luck, right? If you're in a tunnel or underground, you're in a subway, um, cave, whatever, uh, basement, you're going to have very, uh, very poor, if any, reception at all, right? So uh, you might need a completely uh, new uh, or different system because uh, it just flat out won't work. Because the signals are pretty weak with the low signal noise ratio, they're pretty easy to jam. And um, uh, also they're susceptible to spoofing. So I can set up a uh, uh, my own transmitter. Uh, the commercial signals at least are well known. Uh, and so I can synthesize them and transmit them, but do it in such a way that um, spoofs the main signal, I can just make it a little bit stronger. And so your receiver will lock onto my signal instead of the one that's in the satellite. And I can make you think you're somewhere else than where you are. I might uh, uh, just shift you 100 meters. Uh, but if you're a ship, that might mean you run aground uh, in the fog or, or at night where you can't see and you're relying on GPS to navigate. Um, or I could uh, cause your uh, drone to uh, fly somewhere else or your missile or your smart bomb or something to, uh, to go somewhere where you're not expecting it to go. Um, so yeah, kind of in general, this uh, uh, 
Uh, next one goes with poor reception in buildings and tunnels. You, you really need a clear view of the sky uh, and one that's broad enough to get enough different satellites, right? So if you only have uh, just like a, a peephole above you, um, uh, you're, you're only going to catch maybe one satellite as it travels right above you. Uh, you need to be able to see multiple different satellites uh, properly distributed around the sky to get a good good fix. And uh, this one's kind of interesting. Um, if you're uh, trying to navigate yourself to the moon uh, or you're in a geosynchronous orbit above medium Earth orbit, um, you're not going to get uh, signals in the same way. Um, so um, all, all the signals are directed towards the Earth. And so unless you're catching the edge of a signal from a satellite that's on the opposite side of the Earth than you are, you're, uh, you're not going to get the signal. So um, we have to have other solutions for these other localization issues. All right. Uh, okay, so that uh, covers uh, GPS. Again, uh, and GNSS systems in general, they they do all operate under the same basic principles, although all the details can be different. Um, if you're interested in this, then yeah, as, as part of the structure of this course, it gives you an opportunity to dive deeper into these. Uh, there's lots more to look at in uh, in uh, GPS-based localization issues. So, um, all right, but let's consider uh, some other methods. Uh, and one that we'll look at is odometry. Okay, so if you're starting from a known location, now keep track of your movement, basically how fast you're going, what direction you're going, and how long you go that direction and speed. And use that to continuously update your position estimate, right? So uh, the naval equivalent of this is normally called dead reckoning, right? So if you spend any time on a boat, um, you might navigate by dead reckoning. And um, so uh, I just kind of created a little equation here that kind of attempts to describe that. So. P0 here is your initial location, um, you know, depending upon your coordinate system. Uh, you might be confined to a line, and so you could just look at this in one dimension, but, you know, generally we're in two or three dimensions, right? So uh, this would be uh, a vector uh, or array or something, right? So, um, but then we add to that this kind of accumulation of uh, from time equals zero or the same time we got this initial position fix up to the present time t and we look at that velocity over that time that velocity could be a function of time right so we don't always go the same speed and, and direction uh, we might speed up we might slow down we might turn um, but if we integrate that uh, uh, with uh, dt there then we'll uh we'll get an accumulated distance right so uh so our position at t is equal to cap t is is this so what what, what are the implications of this though right so we need to be accurate at this thing and we need to be accurate at uh you know measuring or implementing our speed or bearing and our time or if we have any errors, they may uh, accumulate, right? So, um, all right, so how can we do this? Well, we might have some basic uh, wheel encoders. Uh, these are using machinery a lot, uh, robotics, um, where you have a, uh, a wheel and they've got some slits in it. Sometimes these slits are in a unique pattern so you can not only count the number of uh, uh, lips of light that are shining through this um, uh, per second uh, or per minute uh, but you can uh, if they're 
kind of uniquely, uh, there's some uniqueness around the angle. You can get some position information out of it, right? But we're we're particularly interested in how many revolutions uh, of a wheel are we going through, right? And if we know the um, circumference or diameter radius of that wheel, then we can uh, calculate the amount of distance that we've traveled, right? So number of revolutions uh, times the circumference of that wheel should be the amount of distance that we travel, right? We can get our bearing from, let's say, an electronic compass. Uh, so we, uh, we can measure that relative to the magnetic north pole um that's not exactly at the uh true north pole uh the magnetic north pole is offset from the true north pole and it wobbles around a little bit but that's uh well characterized and so it's pretty easy routine to make that adjustment right uh or we can uh uh use uh, some accelerometers and gyroscopes in addition to an electronic compass that might all be integrated into an inertial measurement uh, unit, an IMU. Uh, these might be uh, more uh, lunchbox sized uh, or can be chip sized. Um, uh, kind of kind of varies in uh, how much you want to pay and um, what kind of accuracies you want out of it. So uh, these are generally pretty accurate over short time frames, but any inaccuracies uh, and drift, uh, it's gonna add up quickly, particularly if it's kind of deterministic or systematic, right? So if, if it's just kind of random noise, maybe sometimes it adds a little distance, sometimes it, it uh, subtracts a little distance and stuff, but any determinism, um, really causes some problems, right? So, uh, you know, the book talks a little bit about steering um, and uh, brings up this Ackerman steer. This is what a car is, right? So you've got, uh, you know, front wheel steering, um, back wheels that are typically fixed. You turn around a corner and um, the inside wheels travel less than your outside wheels. Right? And to prevent skidding, you've got, um, you know, some uh, differentials. You've got um, um, the, the angle that these uh, wheels are at um, uh, can, can vary a little bit. But, uh, you know, if you're a mechanical engineer, there's lots to dive in right there. Um, but, you know, basically these... Uh, 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 you know, we, we have to kind of uh, uh, average these steering wheels in order to get the right uh, movement, right? So any bearing errors are going to build up quickly with increasing distance traveled, right? So if you're, you're off by, you know, you can just look at this with your... Um, you know, uh, uh, trigonometry, right? So if you're off by a, a small uh, fraction of a degree, um, but you don't go very far along that hypotenuse, then yeah, your error is not that big a deal. But uh, the farther you travel, uh, the more that error is going to build up, right? So um, as kind of, you know, just noting that not everything's Ackerman steered, right? So a tracked vehicle may pivot on a stop track uh, or, or a slow track. Uh, it's a little bit different. Um, uh, marine vessels, now you're being steered by probably a rudder, although it could be an asimpod. Um, but uh, marine vessels, along with uh, planes, uh, drones, and that type of thing will be set off uh, from their intended course by wind and, uh, you know, marine vessels also by the current in, uh, in that. So um, those, those things can build up.
All right, so we look at both systematic and non-systematic errors. Uh, systematic errors could be things like a mismatch between what you think the wheel diameter is and what it actually is, so that your wheel encoder is um, you know, multiplying by an incorrect uh, circumference. Um, uh, you can have a mismatch between the nominal and actual wheelbase uh, or the, the spacing of your uh, steering wheels or your rear wheels on your car, uh, or misalignment of those wheels. Uh, these are uh, systematic and um, because they might uh, tend to kind of accumulate, they can be a problem. Now, if you spend just as much time turning right as you do turning left, maybe these type of things uh, cancel out. But uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, well, with, with uh, the steering. But if you have a mismatch, if you're, let's say your tires are not inflated as much as uh, what you think, or you go the you know, you, you change your tires and you go to a, 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 a narrower type uh, tire, one that doesn't have as much uh, uh, wall uh, depth to it, then, uh, yeah, your diameter's changed and you know, your speedometer will be off and, and your odometer will be off and uh, and these uh, all these things will be off, right? So, uh, but we also have non-systematic type of things. Uh, you might be driving over some bumpy terrain, uh, four-wheeling or something, uh, uh, and you might have some slippage uh, uh, or spins due to that or, you know, loss of traction in one way or another, right? So uh, that might be during a turn or it might be uh, uh, from a, a stop and starting or vice versa and that type of thing, right? So, um, yeah, as I said, these systematic errors can accumulate non-systematic errors may cause some uh, locally large errors, but it also may average out over time, um, kind of. Uh, but yeah, you need to understand which one is dominating and, uh, and attack those to try to reduce your errors. All right, and then uh, uh, mechanical versions uh, and, and all aren't the only ways of doing it. I, I did mention uh, uh, these, uh, IMUs, so uh, you can have a nine degree of freedom accelerometer, uh, sometimes called uh, that, or uh, uh, called more of an IMU or inertial measurement unit. Uh, and here, where we get these nine degrees of freedom, well, we got our X, Y, Z in terms of rotation. We've got our uh, pitch, roll, and yaw in terms of rotation, or it could be specified in other, other ways. Um, and we also have our magnometer, our, our compass, our electronic compass. And uh, well, that's actually uh, uh, specified in three dimensions also, because uh, yeah, the magnetic north is not sitting right at the surface of uh, the earth up there. Uh, it, um, uh, there is some uh, effects in three, uh, three different axes. Uh, and and stuff so uh if you ever done any uh, uh private pilot lessons training or whatever you uh learn that you need to uh uh be aware that your uh compass will uh deviate when you uh do a uh, turn uh because you're you're sloping or you're uh um uh banking that uh airplane and the compass that's mounted to it. So, all right, uh, higher grade systems. So, so these can be used uh, with MEMS type techniques uh, and you can get this in a chip level type of thing. Uh, you can buy one of these pretty cheap from uh, SparkFun or one of those places where you get your uh, Arduino boards and they'll plug right in. Um, but uh, at the other end of the uh, spectrum, you might have one in a spacecraft or on an ICBM or a submarine. Uh, and these things, uh, there's, um, uh, I think Lockheed Martin in the New York City area somewhere uh, has a division that works on very, very high-end gyroscopes, uh, spinning at very high speeds and vacuums and that type of thing. And they're going to have much better drift. 
um, much much lower sensitivity to all these kind of errors. Uh, compass in particular, you've got to be concerned about any metal, uh, uh, any metal that can affect a magnet uh, in nearby areas, uh, and that's why uh, if you get a new phone. Um, as soon as you start trying to use that compass, it'll tell you to kind of move that phone around in all sorts of different directions, right? Uh, what it's doing is it's trying to calibrate that electronic compass in there to the metals in that phone and any other uh, um, uh, things in that phone that are affecting it. So I uh, can cancel that out. All right. Um, Wow, we've gone a long ways here. It's almost eight o'clock. Let's take a uh, 10 minute break and um, come back at, uh, at uh, let's see, I've got uh, 6.50, so it's 7.50 your time, Eastern time. So yeah, let's uh, come back at eight o'clock. Uh, don't have any of those uh, polls, uh, Google form polls this week. So just enjoy your break and we'll see you in uh, nine minutes. And if you have any questions, feel free to pop those in the chat. Uh, I'll try to address them. Get back. <laughs> 